Welcome to the Producers Chair, where Nashville's top record producers give you their stories on how they got started in the music business. Join us at Soundstage Studios in Nashville as they share defining moments in their careers to their historic relationships with the biggest artists, musicians, and songwriters in the industry today. And now, the host of the Producers Chair, James Ray. On this episode of the Producers Chair, I welcome Tom Hambridge. God, Tom is a writing machine who not only has 500 cuts in multiple genres, but over 50 producer, songwriter, and musician awards, including two Grammys, five Grammy nominations, and a boatload of Blues Music and Blues Blast awards. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see everybody. Thanks. For- I know. You know, you're like Dick Clark. You never age. <laughs> Know. You know that? Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm old. Um, yeah, Hurt So Bad um, by Susan that Tom produced. Um, well, it didn't hurt so bad when it hit because it became no. <laughs> nominated for a Grammy. Um, that was 18 years ago. And that album um, that it was on, Just Won't Burn, absolutely exploded when that album came out. Um, it was, um, interestingly enough, um, Tom, before he came to Nashville, had already won quite a number of um, um, awards from the Boston Music Awards, and that was around the time that you did that album as well, bef- yeah. just before you came to Nashville, right? Right. Yeah. Um, you'd won like five Boston Music Awards, and that one made it, I think that one made it number six, actually. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I've studied. I'd study this sh- stuff preparing for this. Yeah. Yeah. So just, just, just you nod. Me, just right? nod, because <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. expect you to have a memory yeah. for all this, yeah. all these details. Um, was getting the um, at the Grammy nom for that album. What kind of was the moment in time when you and Chris decided that it was time to move to a major music center? Was that kind of a catalyst? Uh, yeah, well, I think that album in itself, uh, uh, kind of when that blew up, mm-hmm. and um, I was living in Boston and uh, playing with a lot of the people that you mentioned, uh, a lot of those bands, and and I had my own band, and we were pretty successful regionally, and I was working, uh, we used to joke, like I was working 400 and some sh- shows a year. Which wow. some people go, well, that's just not enough. You know, there's only 365 days in a year. You know, <laughs> I was like, well, I would do doubles. You know, I do doubles and triples, and uh, which was wonderful. But um, I think uh, I just felt after that album uh, was on the radio, and then I had produced it and wrote the songs, and 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 so record companies started kind of discovering or reading the liner notes and going, well, who did this? This guy did this. You know, and so they would call me and say. You know, maybe you want to write some songs for this guy, this artist, or maybe produce this record. And and uh, I was so busy doing the things that I always did in Boston and New England that I just thought I really want to go somewhere where there's an industry, yeah, and I can kind of um, you know uh, reset everything. Mm-hmm. And um, so me and uh, my wife Chris, we had Rachel, our first uh, child, and. Um, we just were gonna. We went to New York. We thought we'd go to New York or L.A. And then we just thought. I said, "Well, there's a there's a community down in Nashville where there's studios and publishers and stuff. Maybe maybe that would be the place." So we came down here, and we were down here less than 24 hours, and we loved it. We just said, "This is great." And she said, I, "I'd love to come down here." So that was the big key. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, interesting. You know, you'd been the the band leader for um, many. Um, very iconic acts like um, Martha Reeves and the Vandellas and Bo Diddley and Little Anthony and Chuck Berry, yeah. right? Prior to coming to Nashville, um, how many times did you have? How many times have you played Dancing in the Street? Oh, a lot of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's so wonderful. And you know what? It, what was actually a sidebar, a little highlight. I remember with my band one time, I play. Oh, I played. Let me think. I did an outside concert in Boston with Martha Reeves and the Vandellas, and, uh, and there must have been ten thousand people at Government Center or whatever, you know, watching yep. this thing. And then there was a big rock club called the Channel, which was, you know, original rock club and uh, probably about a five hundred, six hundred seater. And I was playing there that night, and I said to her, she said, well, "What are you doing now?" I said, "I gotta go. I got a gig. We're on at like eleven or something that night, you know, the last band." 
and she came with the Vandellas and <laughs> sat in, and we did it <laughs> with my band, and the place went crazy. Oh, you know, I'll so bet. those are little fun little times where, God, you know, they couldn't believe it. They were, you know, what year w or um, how long were you with Martha and the Vandellas? Did well, you play with her about a year or no, one quite tour? A few years. Or? Well, the w the way it would work was that um, a lot of those acts they would hire a band leader mm -hmm. and uh, for a regional area, you know, okay. like um, even when I moved to Nashville. Um, a guy called me and said, um, "I'm forgetting his name Bo right Diddley. now." Well, well, no, is that this, what you were no, talking no, about? No, this is just a just a, a musician in oh, town, okay. and said, "Hey, I heard you were a, you play drums for all these people. When they come to Nashville, mm -hmm. would you play drums for, you know, Martha Reeves and all that?" Yeah. And um, actually, it, it, it killed me to say no, but I just I was trying to move away from just doing all that stuff. I just mm -hmm. wanted to maybe write some songs and produce some records. Yep. And, um, Stay in town. Yeah. And so, uh, but, yeah. So so a lot of those, to answer your question, I guess it would be like Little Anthony and the Imperials, you know, whenever he would do the Northeast, mm -hmm. I would be his drummer. Yep. And, uh, you know, the Coasters or the Drifters or yeah. the Shirelles, the Marvelettes, the blah, blah, blah. A lot so of them, a lot back of them. then now, yeah. and, and I don't know because I'm not, you know, I'm not a drummer. Um did you got did you have ear monitors back then? No, no. You didn't. No. Okay. Um so you back in the old days. Yeah, back in the old days, right. <laughs> so just out of curiosity, as a drummer, yeah. today when you play, you have ear monitors, right? Yeah. Well, you know, what do you like in your mix? Um what do you like to hear? Do you want the lead vocal right on top? Yeah, yeah, I like to hear the lead vocal. I like to hear the singers, you know, cuz yeah. I'm playing a song. If if they're singers, I that's what I want to listen to, you know. So I'm not concerned. And also it's funny cuz being a drummer like every time I sit down, they to this day, you know, they always go, uh, you know, what, you know, how about the drums? You want the drums really loud? And I'm like, "No, I don't want the drums in it at all. I don't really need to hear the drums. I'm sitting right here hitting them." I can feel them. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I don't need them, man. And they're always astonished. They're always like, "What? You don't want the kick drum really loud and the low end boom?" And I go, "No. I, I want to hear everybody else, you know?" And and uh, so, it's going to be loud where I am. Yeah. So, when you were band leader for for all these people, right? Mm -hmm. Um what were your responsibilities as band leader? Well, or a lot of times I would hire the musicians, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, if it was Chuck Berry, you know, I was hiring the piano player and the bass player and and, um, and also running down, like with Chuck Berry, he wasn't going to rehearse. He wasn't going to tell you what he's going to play. So I had to kind of make sure the band. Yeah, that yep. they knew this is how it's going to go down. Yeah. When he does this, that means that. Uh -huh. When he does this... Watch out! You know right. this is how we're doing yeah. it. You know this one word yeah, means this. Yeah, and I'll cue you on this, and uh, he always ends with that. Yeah, and um, you know, blah blah blah. So, yeah. so that's kind of the, you know, the thing. Yeah. Um, tell us what it was like getting on your feet um, when you first moved to Nashville, because probably every one of us here from somewhere else, we've all experienced it. What was it like for you? Uh, well, it, it was scary, you know. I mean, I came here and I didn't know anybody. Um, I and I, I think in the interview when you when you when you phoned me about about this, I was telling the story about when I came to town. You know, uh, me and Chris and and Rachel, we I rented uh, an a, a house in Sylvan Park and. Um, and we were just, I was just sitting on That's the That's over off Murphy Road? Y yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was just, uh, yeah, that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 and uh, I, I was just kind of sitting on the porch going, okay, well, I, I was playing 450 shows a year and making every record and playing on everything. And here I am sitting on my porch. Wow, what are these things? Fireflies, you know? Yeah, just kind of going. Wow, yeah. you know, we I remember we were going. Well, look at them all, <laughs> and, I, and and I was just thinking, what am I going to do, you know? And uh, it just so happened that uh, um, I, I also played with Sean Anna, this band, Sean Anna, and uh, all these bands are before your time, a lot of you, but but uh, yeah, and they were great. And Jocko, one of the original guys, he was. Um, he called me and he's like, man, what's you know, what's this number I'm calling you on? We, we need we need you out in Las Vegas to do this show. And I said, oh man, I said I'm 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 in Nashville, and uh, I you know I'm I'm kind of just not gonna take any more gigs, you know, for a while. And he's like, what are you doing in Nashville? And I told him, I said I moved down here and we're just, you know, he goes, okay, you got a pencil? Call this guy. His name is Chip Young. 
He goes, call this guy. And I go, well, what does he do? He goes, well, I don't know what he does right now, but but just call him, and he's he's a good guy to know. And so I called him, and he was in the publishing department at MCA Records. Mm-hmm. And when I called him, I just said, uh, you know, this is crazy, but this guy Jocko from Sean and I, he goes, Jocko? How's Jocko? You know? <laughs> and I go, he told me to call you. I just Jocko. wanted to tell. I know. So I, I, bada bing. You yeah. Know? And, and, it, and uh, <laughs> he goes, well, okay, well, let's do a 2 o'clock on Wednesday or something. And I'm like, what do you mean a 2 o'clock on Wednesday? He goes, you know, we'll, d- we'll have a meeting. And I was like, okay, what are, what are we talking about? You know, and, and he goes, uh, songs, man, bring some songs. And I said, oh, okay. And uh, so I just I kind of just showed up. The thing that was cool was that I did, I had a friend named Angelo that we didn't really know each other, but he was from Boston. He's a very, very successful songwriter, but I really didn't really know him. We were kind of in different camps. And um, he called me and said, hey, welcome to town. And I said, uh, I said, he said, what are you doing? I said, I, I, nothing really. I said, but I do have a meeting with this guy, and, and, he, and he wants me to bring songs. What does that mean? And he goes, <laughs> he, goes well, he goes, well, put it this way. Bring some songs, but you're probably not going to listen to many. He'll probably listen to like 30 seconds or something and move on. So be prepared for him to go you know, through them Just go quick. through, and I said, oh, yeah. gotcha, cool. So all I did was brought down my first solo album. So he didn't care for your catalog. No, this guy, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I showed up at the meeting, and, and, and he goes, what do you got? And I go, well, I got this. And he goes, okay. And he put it on, and he turned his back to me because it was like a control room kind of thing. He's listening through the speakers, and, and the record was like 51 minutes long. He didn't – the only thing he did was he turned around like after the first song, and he said, these are all your songs? And I said, yeah. And he just listened to all the and songs. And that was it. He had that his was back it. for that the was rest it. of the And I just album. thought – Wow, this is not what Angelo said. Yeah. This is crazy. And uh, and then he turned around and he said, okay, how's 35 sound? And I was like, 35, uh, that's a cool number. You know what I mean? Like I had no idea what he was talking about. 35 you know? what? Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. He, and, he goes, and he goes, okay, how about 40? And I go, I, 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 you know, literally, I was like, I don't know what you're talking about at all. And he goes, for a publishing deal, $40,000. And I was like what and he goes uh, you know and he goes uh, you know and i and i told him i said you know i'm not uh, you know i'm not I, I don't know i don't know if that's good bad i don't know what's going on here you know and uh, i was honest with him you know and and he he said uh um so he was really cool and, and he goes you know what are you hungry and i'm like sure and he goes let's go out to eat and and he became kind of a uh, the first guy in town that i met and he was just like he just thought he goes you know if you if you can hold on to your publishing, you know, that's cool, you know? And uh, I said, well, I, I've been just working, you know, and I, I didn't even know it was worth anything. So this is cool. So uh, that's how it started. That was my first meeting in Nashville. And, um, wow. and, and, and I didn't take the deal, you know? You so, didn't? No, I didn't take the deal. Right, and you've pretty much held on to your publishing ever since. Well, it was funny because later on, <laughs> after Susan Tedeschi's thing hit and a couple other things hit, uh, another record company, another publishing company flew me to New York and uh, they they took me out to eat in New York and they offered me like five times that at lunch. And, and I t- that was the hardest one to turn down. But the reason I turned it down was I thought to myself, these guys – if these guys are offering me this, and they're much smarter than I am, and they've been doing this much longer than Imagine I Imagine what it's worth. I said, I think, <laughs> I think maybe I got something, you know, that I should just hold on to. And, um, you know, it's the difference of getting, uh, you know, getting it all right now or just piecemealing it for a long time, but you own it, you know. So that's kind of, that's the kind of the route we took. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Um, it wasn't long after that in 2004 that you actually got your second Grammy nom- nomination for Johnny Winter's I'm a Bluesman album. Right, right. Uh, yeah. I yeah, mean, Johnny Winter. Very good. Johnny Winter. Yeah. 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 I mean, we're, talk- we're talking, mis- you know, another icon. Oh, My yeah. goodness. Um, how did that come about? How did you and Johnny meet? That was just through... Um, he had heard uh, Rock Me Right and these songs that I'd written for Susan Tedeschi. Uh-huh. And, and on his bus, I guess he was playing them, that record over and over. 
So that kind of opened up doors for me. And his manager called and said that Johnny was thinking about making a record, and he had a longtime producer named uh, Richard Sherman. Mm -hmm. So and so I was kind of like gonna come in and do like a song. He said, "Can you write a song like Rock Me Right for for me, and and produce it?" You know. So I wrote a song called Lone Wolf. That was Johnny's Lone Wolf. That yeah, was Johnny's Lone. from Texas, okay. and I just I was so excited about Johnny Winter, even ta even even the possibility of working with him. So I wrote the song and um, and I demoed it and I sent it to him, and that's that's when he said, "Well, can you do some more?" You yeah. know, and uh, and so that's how that yeah. worked. So what was it like to work with him? It was great. I mean, the coolest thing was he asked me to to ride on the bus with him, to to get to know him a little bit, and that was spooky <laughs> and and cool at the same time because he's, I mean, I grew up. You know, as a young kid going to see him play, and and you know, I mean, still to this day, his record Johnny Went Around Live is yeah, pff, you know, know that that thing will just slays me every time. When when other musicians or drummers will say, "Man, what, what do you what do you recommend?" I go, "Just go get this record." I'll even bought it for people. I've even said, "Here, just yeah. listen to this. Listen to this band." You know, and um, but uh, so he was not in the best physical condition. And, um, was he doing drugs when you were with him? No, he, or that was, he all was all in the past. See the see point. the see the thing, you know. I'm not an expert on on him or anything, but no. the, the thing about it was he, being an ex heroin addict, he was on methadone, mm -hmm. and he never they never took him off methadone. Oh, okay. So that was the, he was on that, and uh, he was an albino. He didn't, you know, w dinner with him was a little. Uh, in his hotel room was a little uh, uh, one of those burners that you put on and a can of soup, and he would have a can of soup, and I was like, you know, other artists I'm with were at a five star Restaurants. dinner or something, or yeah. they're taking making sure he has vitamins or something, you know, yeah. or a little salad, and this was just, um, <laughs> and he would have a glass of um, it was called a Johnny Winter Special, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I always wanted to know what that was. I said, well, what's in that? Uh, vodka. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Looks like water, but it's vodka. And uh, so, at the time, they were trying to get him healthy. You know, uh, and and a actually, before he died, um, I heard that he got he got you know off methadone, and he was doing really well. And um, you know, yeah, he actually. Um, I, I I wanted to do a little you know reading just to yeah. find out what I could. And, and according to what I found online t um, yesterday, um, he actually died of a combination of um, emphysema and um, what was the other thing and, and uh, pneumonia. Well, yeah, he was on tour. He was in yeah. a hotel room. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but one of the greatest, you know. If and like uh, that guy should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. uh, it's you know, my gosh, <clears throat> you know. But yeah, and on his album, I mean, you produced the album. You per played percussion on it. You did background vocals on it. I mean, you you significantly contributed to that to that album, which is very cool. Um, and and it's kind of interesting. Johnny Winter was the very first non Afro American musician um, to be inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame. Oh wow! Well, that's I good. found that good. out while I was looking around. Good for him. Isn't that cool? Um, you told me that you don't consider yourself to be a blues drummer. <laughs> kind of. Is that what I said? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I was saying that as a as a as a blues producer, everyone goes, "You're you're a, you're." Uh, I mean, I like all kinds of music. Yeah. You know, and I I uh, I, I work in all the different fields of uh, genres of music. Um, but uh, I, you know, to be honest with you, I mean, I think uh. I, I do feel that I I do play the drum play the drums, and uh, and play the blues when I'm playing the drums sometimes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes. Uh, um, you were saying um, that you're, well, let's put it this way: in um, in two fourteen and in two sixteen, um, Tom was Blues Music Awards winner of the Instrumentalist of the Year, Drummer of the Year. Isn't that cool? Yeah. 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 Yep. And um, 
and and you of course are a singer. You've sung on a mil, you know, a million people's albums. Plus, you've done seven albums of your own now. You know, um, as far as the the writing goes, would you say that your strength is writing melody or lyrics? Just the curi- do you have any feel for that? Uh, you know, well, I think uh, on different days, different. You know, okay. Sometimes, sometimes it's, it's one and uh, then the other. The, the words and sometimes it's uh yeah it's a melody you know yeah well i love the melody in that song thanks um and and of course as i mentioned earlier tom and his daughter rachel are going to sing for you tonight yeah. Isn't that cool? yeah yeah so you've done um seven albums of your own now and um i'm i'm curious when did the rattlesnakes surface was that on um on the black rose album in 207 because I was trying uh, to figure you know, that I out. I think so. Well, I think I should know this. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that was just they were the, the records were always uh, just Tom Hambridge, right? You know, and I would go out with a band, and I would perform on all kinds of places, and and uh, I'd go do tours with a band, and it was these guys, and so uh, we were getting ready to do a live album, mm-hmm. and um, on that tour, I said we should have a name for the band, you know, and. Uh, so, so we came up with the rattlesnakes. And I was going to ask you where the name came from. Did someone in the band or you have an I, you experience know, with I, the rattlesnake? No, I, I don't no? know. I think it was probably like it won out of the best names on the drive to the gig or something. Uh, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, really, I mean, I, I don't. <sighs> no, it's okay. And who are the rattlesnakes? Who are the guys? Well, now, now there's a bunch of rattlesnakes. So, so <laughs> at that at that time, it was uh, it was Brian Love, a great guitar player. Brian Love, um, originally. Yeah, Sal Baglio, yep. uh, a wonderful guitar player, um, and Tommy McDonald on bass, and uh, we had a drummer named Kevin Rapillo because I would go out front and sing, then I'd come back and play drums, and uh, another guitar player named Jimmy Scopa who would do a lot of the dates too. So, mm-hmm. but there's been a lot of different rattlesnakes yeah. coming in and out. Yeah. Know, but yeah. Um, okay, so let's move on because we got a lot to cover here. In 209. Um, you got your third Grammy nomination for Buddy Guy's Skin Deep album. And um, um, it also won uh, Best Contemporary Blues Album um, at the Blues Music Awards. And uh, Eric Clapton was featured on that album, right? Yeah, yeah. Tell us the, uh, tell us the whole story about how Eric Clapton won up on that album and you were recording him and producing Yeah, well, him. you know, yeah, there, there's that, a lot. That well, just being around Buddy Guy, um, you know, everybody wants to be around Buddy Guy, including famous, you know, Other legendary icons. icons. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they just so, so I have been in many situations that are, you know, crazy. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell my wife, I'm, I'm like, I remember being at the... <laughs> You know, at the <laughs> White House thing, at one point in the the hotel lobby bar with Buddy and Robert Plant goes, "Hey man, can can we butt in? You know, like, and can you introduce us to Buddy? You know, <laughs> and it's uh, <laughs> Jimmy Page and it's Robert Plant wow. and it's uh, and so so it's and I'm like looking at them like. <laughs> oh my <You're> gosh! <laughs> you know, like uh, I'm thinking of the album cover. You know, let's up. I'm looking yeah. at the guy going, "Wow!" <laughs> so, so a lot of stuff happens like that. Or Buddy will say to me while we're recording, um, and those guys are great. They love, they love Buddy. So they just, they just didn't want to interrupt him. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what <laughs> yeah. they were. You know, but but uh, but a lot of times, uh, Buddy will just say to me, "I'll be, I'll be recording a record." And he'll say, uh, "Who do you think should play on this?" And I'll go, "Well, you know." You know, uh, I don't know. And he'll go, call Eric. <laughs> and I'll go, I don't have Eric's number. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, and, I, and I think I know the Eric you're talking about. You know, and he'll go, he'll go. And so oh, that's, that's how funny. stuff like that starts. And um, he'll, he'll do that all the time. He'll say, you know, um, yeah. call Keith, you know. Yeah. And I'll go. Okay, I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah, but you're gonna have to write the number <laughs> down for me, and uh, you know, so that's how that stuff starts. But that's normally, funny. when I call these people, they go, "Buddy guy, oh my gosh, absolutely." You know, uh, I'll yeah. be there in a heartbeat, and and uh, and so many. Uh, there's so many stories of these wonderful artists that have just said, I mean, on the latest record with uh, Billy Gibbons mm-hmm. um, from ZZ Top, you know, 
I was fortunate enough to have worked with, with those guys, but I called Billy. I had a song that I wrote called Where You Out, and, and I just thought it was, a, it was perfect for Billy Gibbons. But we were getting ready to close out the record. We only had like a week left. And I just called Billy and said, I don't know where you are. And he said, well, I'm on my way to Atlanta to do a show. Um, and I said, well, I've got like a day to finish this thing. And he goes, uh, all right, let me just point my tour bus to Nashville. Uh -huh. And I'll get there. I love it. We'll do it. It's for Buddy. I want to be there. And uh, and then I'll make it late to the thing. He had his own bus, you know. And But that's the kind of stuff that, you know, <laughs> A lot of guys do, and and there's many stories of that. Yeah. So, so hearing Eric play and sing on one of my songs, or any of these folks, Van Morrison or whatever, you know, you're like, yeah, really. you know. But it all comes from Buddy, really. Those yep. those stories, cause, sure. Because uh, oh, I understand. You know, there are records where I'll just call, like Billy, I'll call Billy, but but there are, but they'll do it because of the artist. You know, they'll do it because. What's Eric Clapton like? Is he um, is he a serious cat in the studio, or is he a jokester? Well, I don't really know Eric. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I've met, you know we we work together very quickly, but but he is he is uh, um, uh, you know of 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 all the artists, I don't really know Eric that well. I don't really know Eric that well. Eric uh, doesn't say much. Didn't say much, but he mm -hmm. was kind, wonderful, and and there for Buddy, mm -hmm. and he did a great guitar solo and sang yeah. the hell out of the song. And um, would do it again, and 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 we'll do anything for Buddy. And um, always, when I've been in situations where where, where um, he Eric's doing a concert, and Buddy Buddy has called me and said, "Let's go, let's go." Eric wants me to come down and sit in or whatever. Mm -hmm. And Eric is uh, gracious, uh, wonderful, and, and takes the time with Buddy, and and I'm just there, you know. Yeah. So I I don't want to give any false impressions like me and me and Eric are tight, you no, know. I understand. <laughs> but uh, but it's wonderful. Yeah. He's a wonderful cat. Yeah. So when you when you were in the studio, you know, producing that, and and Eric was sitting there and he's playing away, you didn't you didn't mess with him a little bit. No. You, you didn't say to him, "Do you mind just playing a little less and backing <laughs> off on that solo a little bit?" No. I do know. Just I, to see I, what he'd say. No, no. I, I do know though that I uh, when I when I when I after I, afterwards when I sent him the track, he you know he sang the whole thing. He loved the song. He sang the whole thing, and and. Uh, you know, I didn't use a lot of it, you know, because Buddy, I was featuring Buddy. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a lot of stuff that my engineer was like, we're not using this. I'm like, no, we're not using this. So the world will never hear this. Wow. I'm like, I know, I know. But mm -hmm. but it's also I'm producing the record for Buddy Guy. Yeah. You know? So, um, yeah, that's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, how about some questions? Have we got a mic up here that we're going to put up for questions? Buddy Guy and and uh, and Chuck Berry have got to be two of the most influential people on all the music that we do or write and everything. From a writing standpoint, where are you drawn from to take that to another level? Well, I, I and I agree with what you're saying. I mean, with Chuck Berry, I, I think he is one of the, one of the greatest songwriters ever, and and um, I think he doesn't get a lot of credit for inventing rock and roll <laughs> or inventing yeah. what we do. And um, uh, his lyrics, uh, I mean, I, 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 I'm definitely very influenced by him. And I, I think, uh, uh, I mean, I, I listen to him, you know, his meter, his rhythm, uh, his rhyme schemes were way, in, in, you know, ahead of the game, ahead of the curve. You know, uh, you know coffee colored Cadillac, his alliteration. Everything. I don't know where this guy was coming from. And supposedly at Chess Records, they said that that he would go into the <laughs> studio, track, and then you know play the song, and and they would say, "Would well, you have lyrics for it?" He goes, "Yeah, I'm gonna write them now." And he would write Nadine and O'Carroll and Johnny Be Good and Roller Beethoven. I mean, tell Tchaikovsky the news. You know, I mean, he was just, you know, I mean, a genius. And so uh, that was the, the thing that I loved when I was playing with him because I. Um, and he always seemed like he was smarter than the room. You know what I mean? <laughs> when he was he was pulling it over on the audience while he was doing while we were playing. It always <laughs> seemed like he uh, he uh, you know he knew it. And uh, so, anyways, I, I you know and, and Buddy Guy of course is is wonderful. So yeah, I'm Dave. I'm just a local producer, and mm -hmm. I am very curious about you know today. It seems like most people want the producer to be the engineer or vice versa. 
and you use your own engineer. So would you explain like the differences in your approach to production versus the engineering? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm not as talented probably as someone like you are in terms of being able to do both, but I find that um, there are engineers that are so good at what they do and they're and they're always um, everything's being updated all the time you know pro tools and 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 they're just focused on that and so I just want to get a guy that has that end of it together where I don't have to worry about that while I'm recording with an artist I would I want to be deep into the music into the song into the performance into what they're playing and um, I can uh, I can always say, you know, hey, can we re-EQ the bass drum here or something that's not, but I'm not, I'm not, my head's not down and I'm doing that. Because I've had guys in the past on the other side of it that are engineer producers that are, you know, you're asking them about, you know, what do you think of this chorus? Is this chorus happening? And they're like, what? You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> I'm working on the guitar sound, you know? And so I, I like to have a guy doing that and then I'm just, focus completely on on the artists so so um there are, i'm sure there are great engineers in this town that do both but i'm i'm kind of the the other side of that um so let's move on in 210 you had what i would probably consider i would imagine this is probably one of the biggest highlights of your life and of your career a kind of a life-altering event uh, you produced the only song that B.B. King and Buddy Guy ever recorded together on Buddy's Living Proof album, right? I guess so. I mean, if it's in your notes. <laughs> <laughs> you got some statistics over there. there. I do. I yeah, do. Some, some Don't wild mess stuff. with me. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you put that together? Who put that together? Well, I, I did. I did. I had just Whoa. done a, a track for... Uh, for BB King uh, on a for Disney mm -hmm. and and uh, and so I actually went to the Ryman to 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 play it for BB King the mix you know after I had finished it I did it in in uh, Las Vegas yeah and uh, that's where BB King lives and then I was at the Ryman and uh, I had to go on his bus and 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 play him the song which I did and that went wonderful and the only thing about that is that he. Uh, there was a lot of very famous people there outside the bus that wanted to meet BB. And, and so everyone was just gonna have a few minutes and I went in and played him the song. Mm -hmm. And he went, play it again. You know what I mean? And, and, and <laughs> so I played it again and he went, play it again. And I kept going, I know there's a lot of people out, out here. He's gotta go on stage like in a half hour, you yeah, know? Like Mick and he Jagger goes, oh waiting, no, you know? play it again, play it again. <laughs> and then uh, Tom, don't leave, play it again. This is great, I love the horns, you know? And he, it was wonderful. So I didn't wanna leave, but I kept thinking, Oh gosh, you know this is the, he, we need to. I need to get out of here, and uh, so when I did uh, later on, <laughs> we, I remember standing on the side of the stage watching the show, and um, and I think it was Kenny Wayne Shepherd said to me, he goes, man, man, uh, it's great, it's great to see him, huh? He goes, man, your song sounds great. He played it for me twice while I was on the bus. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and I, you know, so I, I think he, he just got into a thing where he was just playing it yeah. to everybody. Oh, and that's uh, so wonderful. they uh, hopefully they got in there, whatever they wanted to ask him, you know. Oh. But but he said during the show, um, he said uh, he was playing and he goes, uh, you know, uh, it's so great to be here. He just he was just ad libbing, you know, yeah. And I just hope I get to see you again. You know, I love you all. And uh, yeah, hope, I hope the Lord lets me stay around a little longer. I can come back sometime, you know. And it was one of those things where I just wrote down, stay around a little longer. I hope I can stay a little longer, you know. And and, and I got together with Gary Nicholson. I know. Great writer, great blues writer, too, you know. So I, I got together with him, and I said, I, there's this, you know. And, of course, Gary goes, I had, like, six different notes from the concert. He was at the concert. Oh, you know? so like, he had notes. So too. he was already yeah. there. And then we wrote it, and I, and, and the idea, I, I, but I had to throw it to both camps, Buddy and BB, as if they were singing it together. And they did. And they did a wonderful video. They, and, they, and, and actually now it's really near and dear to Buddy's heart because of the passing of BB. Yeah. And I got them to kind of talk about each other and bb does say during at the end of the song he says you know buddy you've always been my buddy and man, i love you and during the fade he just said this stuff that, that was so clever the way that song was written and the way th that 
that you actually arranged the duo between the two of them, the way they traded the lyric. It, like the lyric went inside out and back. Yeah, you know, you know, you know? What, what was funny about that though is I had to do that separately. I had to do, I did, I recorded it with Buddy, mm -hmm. and then I had to go to uh, Las Vegas and record BB. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they, they both loved it, but it, it was interesting because I, because they, they couldn't get the, they couldn't get that they were um, talking to each other because they weren't in the room with each other. Ah. They're very old school, very like analog. This was, this was <laughs> like, this was like, because I kept saying, no, you got to say, you're my buddy, you know? I, th I thank you for, you know, and he'd go, oh, he's my buddy. I love him. He's so <laughs> great. And I'd go, well, no. It's you. He's going to be in the room. He's going to be in the video <laughs> with you. You know, <laughs> you're talking to him. And he's like, I, it was just this, this, uh, you know, <laughs> every every five seconds I'd stop and go, okay, one more time. And it's B.B. King. You know, I'm like, B.B., you know. He go well. I love him so much. I so um, <laughs> he's. Yeah, I, I love. I love you. He's so good. I go. No, no, no. <laughs> You're looking at him. He goes. Oh, and then he, he starts singing again. And he'd be looking at me. And he'd go. I want to talk about him. And I go. Okay, we're gonna get this. And, and it, 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 it worked. It worked. It did. But it, it was, was uh, wonderful. <laughs> did um, did did you know um, before they actually did that session? Before you guys did that session, how well did they know each other? Were they buddies? Oh, oh yeah. Well, I mean, Had they buddies like ten years younger than than BB. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, what's great about Buddy is that Buddy has the most utmost most respect for BB, and BB's the king. Mm -hmm. So even when they did a they did a tour, you you probably read about this where BB uh, King wasn't feeling that great, and he was talking more than singing, and he was getting up there, and um. Buddy was went out and Buddy said, "No, I'm not. Ha I'm opening. You know, I'm going to open the show." But Buddy will not hold back his performance. You know, he's going to go out and give it. But they would always say, "Well, you know, the reviews might be that Buddy was killing and BB was was talking." And whenever they had brought up anything about to, to Buddy about that, he'd say, "You know, that's that's like sacrilegious. That's you don't talk about the king that way. He's the king. He's always going to be the king." And you know his, mm -hmm. it just was beautiful. I mean, he nice. knew he, that's why we're all playing the blues. That's why, yeah. No one will ever sing like him. No one will ever play like him. Yep. He'd always say the first time I heard, you know, um, "Sweet Little Sixteen or, 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 you know, he said that's there's nothing better. You know, so you know, it was very yeah. cool. That, uh, and by the way, that's that was Tom's first Grammy win. Wow. <laughs> That was a biggie. Yeah. That was a biggie. Gosh. Um, when you were finished the session, did you have a sense that they might do it again sometime or that that would probably be the last time? Well, at the time of when B.B. King died, I was producing, I was, that we, were, we were in the works of me producing a record on B.B. King. Mm -hmm. And that was partly because of Buddy Guy. Yeah. Buddy was just saying, you got to do this before it's too late. And BB said that he kept saying to Jeez, me, "I didn't know that." Yeah, and yeah. but you know, it's not always just the music and all that. There's all kinds of arrangements that have to go into stuff like that. And at the time, BB was on the road nonstop, which which was also you know hard on him. Mm -hmm. And uh, to take him off the road to make another record, you know. Um, takes income out of people's you know the, the machines moving you know mm -hmm. so there was there was that stuff and and but buddy really wanted me to get it done so i had written the songs and you know that's another part of you know obviously as you know songwriters and stuff you know you work really hard on something i worked really hard on this bb king record and he loved the songs they were all kind of about his life i demoed them all we were you know starting production on it and you know it's it's, uh, you know, he passed away. So, so. why you were doing this? Well, we weren't in the studio. I don't with mean him. literally. Yeah, but we. Yeah, this was just all. You know, I was getting it all together to be to to happen. My you know? goodness. And uh, so, like, I would play him the songs on his bus, and he would go, "Oh yeah, yeah, we're gonna do that one and that one." And so it was. We were moving towards it. 
but uh, dang, you know. Well, on this album, on Buddy's album that they that they did the duo, I thought you'd all maybe like to hear and just and bear with me for one second while I read this list, because I find it very interesting who all was on that session. Okay, because these are all people you know, you know. I mean, BB and Tom and 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 Buddy, of course. David Grissom played guitar. Michael Rhodes and uh, Tommy McDonald were on bass. Um, Marty Salmon on piano. Reese Winans on clavinet, Rhodes, B3, Wurlitzer, and piano. The Memphis Horns were on the session. Uh, Wayne Jackson, um, Jack Hale, and, and Tom McGinley. Um, and the backup singers were Becca Bramlett and Wendy Moten. Isn't that cool? I mean, that's historic stuff. Yeah. And, and boy... Nashville must love you for bringing stuff like that to Nashville. You know. By the way, where did you? Did you, by chance, record that here at Soundstage? Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, actually not at Soundstage, but in Nashville. Yeah. Um, but I have done. Matter of fact, this room. I, I, I love this room. This is Ronnie's place. And, yeah. Uh, I've done. I've done quite a few records here and at Soundstage, mm -hmm. which I love. Um, and uh, I just did, uh, I just did a new record that's coming out that you're gonna love. You're all gonna have to be aware of by a guy named Casey James. Yeah, who's a wonderful artist. Did Casey artist. come tonight? Casey's sitting right over there. Where, that's there he right is. here. Right. Yeah. Hey, Casey. How you doing? Yeah. Man? And um, thank you. This is a killer record. I mean, it's a killer record, and we cut it over at Soundstage, and uh, um, yeah, you're all gonna be blown away by this. Yeah. He's an amazing guitar player, an amazing singer, and uh, also he was a, a, a big one on American Idol, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Um, okay, moving on. In 2013, you produced Buddy's Rhythm and Blues album as well, uh, and that turned out to be Buddy's highest charting album of all of the all, all the albums he did, right? Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, the, and this was one of those magnificent albums that had a whole bunch of guest appearances on it. Um, Kid Rock, Keith Urban, Gary Clark Jr., Beth Hart, Muscle Shoals Horns, uh, Steven Tyler, Joe Perry, Brad uh, Whitford from Aerosmith, they were all on the album, right? Yeah. Un unbelievable album. Um, and featuring 18 Tom Hambridge songs. It was a double album. My goodness. <laughs> My goodness. One minute songs. It was a double album. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, how do you bring, and, and, and I think this is a really good little bit of information, if you don't mind um, ex 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 expanding on this a little bit. As a producer, when you, when you want to coordinate and bring together an album that has a lot of guests on it, because I'm sure that it has occurred to a lot of you guys out there. I know that John Goodwin is talking about doing this right now because we talked about it a couple of days ago. Um, tell me some of the challenges and some of the procedures and things like that um, that one must go through when doing that. Yeah, I mean, there's always, uh, well, if you, you know, there's the music part of it would be, you know, finding a song that each of the people like uh, and uh, they have to sing it in the same key. So there's that stuff. You know, there's a lot of that musical stuff that's going into it. Would they sing about that subject matter? Uh, and then there's the the business part of it, which is, you know, do they have an album out? Is there Are they getting ready to record a record? Is this going to... If they're on this record, is it detrimental to their career? Or is it... Is it does the management... Uh, the record company are they cool with the other record company um, you know there's, there's a lot of that stuff yeah. going on so political uh, stuff yeah, yeah all that stuff so, so you have to kind of navigate those waters and um, I always just kind of go and 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 lean hard on the music end of it and go okay I mean like for example uh, Van Morrison was going to sing uh, a song and I uh, that was kind of like a a, you, know, like, you know, it would be great to have Van Morrison on the song, but let's just find out how to get in touch with him. So talking to his his people saying he will not sing on anyone's record. Okay. Okay. And and I'm like, okay, well, uh, 
it's Buddy Guy, and and are you the end? Are you the wall? Is this door locked here, or is it possible for him to say, "Well, you can talk to this pe- this person, maybe, but I, he's going to tell you the same thing I'm going to tell you." So you kind of go and you talk to that person. You send a little email and say, "Hey, I don't know if it's going to get to you, but I was told this." But and they said, "Well, he'll do it only if he writes the song." And you're like, "Okay." So there is a chance that he might do something, though. You know what I mean? So well, who you know? Then well, we, the, his personal day-to-day manager guy is this guy, and so you find that out, and you go. All right, I heard that he will only do his own song, but we've already tracked this song. Would he listen to it? He'll listen to it, but he won't want to do it. <laughs> okay, can I send it? Sure, but I'm telling you, he's not going to like it. To literally, that's ha- this is how this went. To like a week later, having the manager call, so if Van was interested in doing this... <laughs> You know, where would you record it? You know what I mean? And I'm like, uh, well, wherever he would want to record it. Well, he's going to be in Ireland, and he can't come, blah, 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 and his schedule's like this. And I'm like, well, are you saying that he is open to singing on the track? Yes, he actually loves the song and would like to do it. But his – and I'm so I'm like, okay, so, so you have to, like, not get the yeah. first door – and go, okay, I guess I'm going to leave. Right. You know, you got to kind of bust down that door, yeah. go to the next door, and that's how a lot of these things work out, you wow. know? And uh, so it's not... It's 30 not, so phone it's, calls later. Oh, yeah, so it's never a, It's yeah. never like, you know... Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, sometimes it's easy when you're right with the artist. If I'm right with... I mean, I was at... Uh, I was playing... Buddy asked me to play uh, uh, Crossroads with him at Madison Square Garden. With this this huge, you know, Crossroads. It's mm-hmm. crazy. Everyone's there playing. The Almond Brothers and everything. The Rolling Stones are there. It's crazy, and and I'm backstage and everyone's kind of sharing dressing rooms. And I had a song called One Day Away, and I thought, man, Keith Urban would be great on that this song. And and I love Keith Urban. Now, Buddy guy doesn't know everybody in the world. I mean, he they know Buddy, you know, they, but but yeah. he doesn't, you know. So I'm like, hey, Buddy, what do you think if if this guy Keith? I mean, he so he doesn't know Keith Urban, you know. He he doesn't he, now. He does, but but uh, you know, it's even funny when famous people sometimes will say and he'll go, who are they, Tom? Who's this guy I want to meet? And uh, <laughs> you know, and they laugh about it, you know, because they're like, oh, I just want to meet Buddy. And uh, but anyway, so uh, I said. Well, I'm going to just ask him because he's here, you know. And I asked Keith, and Keith, of course, was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding me? I would love to sing a duet with Buddy Guy and play. Can I play on it? I'm like, yeah, yeah, it would be great. So that's th- when that happens, Yeah, you're already kind of around all the other people mm-hmm. that are blocking you, you yeah. know. And uh, so. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I mentioned that um, – um, that you wrote Stay Around a Little Longer with Gary Nicholson. Um, just to talk about some of your other co-writers that you work with. Um, Jeffrey Steele, right? Oh, yeah. You and yeah. Jeffrey have done a lot of writing together. Yeah. Haven't you? Oh, man, yeah. yeah. Um, how did you and Jeffrey meet initially? How did you guys get going together? You know, that was a weird one. I think um, I was I was very new in town, and I was doing a record with this engineer named Scott Baggett, this great engineer. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I actually said to him, I don't even know how I got his name, but I didn't know anybody. So I, somebody told me, if you need an engineer, and this was, this was this record I was doing from somebody else, and I just said, well, I'm in Nashville now. Come down to Nashville, and I'll do the record there. And I said, okay, so now i got to find musicians and engineers and a studio. Someone said, call Scott Baggett. I called Scott, and uh, he was wonderful, and he said, okay, so... Uh, I said, I need a keyboard player. I'm going to play drums and bass player. You know, he gave me names of people, of great people that I still use today. He was like, well, call uh, Tony Harrell. Mm-hmm. Uh, call um, Pat Buchanan, you know? And I was yeah. like, uh, okay, what, what, do you have a number on this guy, you know? <laughs> and uh, can he play, you know? <laughs> and there, he's like, yeah, yeah, they're good. And uh, and so, um, you know, he gave me, like, the top guys, you know? And I so, uh, and so I was at his studio, and... Um, Jeff Steele came over to the studio. It was in Berry Hill, and 
to pick up demos or something that Scott was mm -hmm. mixing for him. Yeah. You know, and uh, Jeff was walked in and was just kind of like, hey, uh, I don't want to interrupt, you know, whatever. And, and Scott goes, you guys should know each other. And that's Scott said, Tom, this is Jeff, Jeff. And and I said, yeah, I just moved to town. And, and, and he's listening to some of the stuff. And, and Scott's going, he's a big, big country writer, you know, and and uh, we said we should we should get together sometime. You know, and that's I didn't even know. You know, it was just like a two o'clock meeting. I didn't know what that meant. Yeah, you know, get together and yeah. write a song, or because I used to write my songs myself. You know, yeah. And uh, I, so this this town, of course, co-writing town. You know, so they were like, you should I should get together, and I'm like, get together and do what? <laughs> and he, you know, write a song. I'm like, oh, gotcha, oh, okay. okay. And and that's how that started, yeah. you know. Like, and then we got to, need somebody. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. got together, and uh, I had to get the terms together. You know, all the terms. <laughs> all the the town has these terms, you know. And so, yeah. So, and we've written hundreds of songs. Literally, I know, hundreds I of know. songs. So. And, 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 and he's unbelievable. You know, you know that. Oh, everybody. He's knows just Jeffrey, yeah. You know. Okay. Um. Let's talk about James Cotton, another icon. That, you, that you've produced. In 214, you produced Cottonmouth Man. And uh, this album, again, incredible album. Um, appearances, guest appearances on this album uh, uh, with uh, Greg Allman, Joe uh, Bonamassa, Ruthie Foster, Delbert McClinton, Warren Hayes, Keb Moe, um, Chuck Leville, and Colin Linden. Uh, what a bunch, what a group. Um, another living legend. As I said, James Cotton, you wrote 12 of the songs on this album, and it won traditional blues album from the Blues Blast Awards. Um, the song, He Was There, is the song um, in particular that I'm talking about. It was nominated for Song of the Year at, at the Blues Music Awards. Um, it's kind of a story, I guess you could say, of James Cotton's life. Yeah, in a way, isn't it? The whole the whole album is. I mean, the whole it, album it, it is. Really, the, it really this is, song yeah. in particular, you know, yeah. certainly speaks to that, and um, it's just a it's just a wonderful song. Well, that's actually he's not singing. He's not singing that. That's why it's a that's a Daryl Newlish was singing on that one. That's why I had all these guests on that album was that oh. James Cotton actually wonderful like one of the greatest you know blues singers lost his voice. I mean, he's got. Um, He's just got uh, something that tore up his vocal cords, and he can't sing I anymore. didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was him singing. No, no, that's actually uh, Daryl Newlish, and, and that's why Greg Allman and, and uh, oh. Dublin Clinton, I, I, I was heavy on just getting singers to come in. And mm -hmm. that's another situation where, you know, he's – him and Buddy Gar are the, the two last guys yeah. standing, you know. Yeah. And uh, when I – you know, that was a situation where I just approached people I knew and said uh, – in the middle of their careers, I just said, hey, you know, would you be interested in doing this? And they all wanted to do it because of James Cotton. You know, it was James Cotton. So, yeah. So we wrote songs about his life. He came up, uh, matter of fact, in this building. I wrote the whole album, all 12 songs in this building. Uh, really? I had an office over there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, had an just, office a, just, here, yeah. A, just a, an office in, uh, um, where I used to write songs. And because uh, and he said, you know, how are we going to do this? And, because I had done Skin Deep and I wrote all the songs on that mm -hmm. about Buddy's life and he said well how are we going to do it I said just come where are you living he goes Austin I said well get up here and spend a couple days with me and tell me about your life and we'll write some songs and, and his stories boy wow I mean he, didn't, he doesn't even have a birth certificate I mean they don't even know how old he is yeah, he, wor he worked on you know a slave uh, you know uh, yeah plantation. he was <laughs> yeah he, Plantation yeah Th there's a song in there called Bonnie Blue that's the only song he sang on it. And that's when I got Colin Linden on yeah. is 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 because you know he's embarrassed now because he can't he, you, know, you know he can't sing anymore. And I said, well, he, he you know he was telling me about being raised on this plantation, cotton plantation. So they didn't have they didn't know how old he was. You know, they didn't have a birth certificate. And it was called. I said, what was the name of it? He was like Bonnie Blue. I said, what is it? He goes Bonnie Blue. I said Bonnie Blue. He goes yeah. He just remembers it was the Bonnie Blue plantation. So I wrote this song at the end of the record about it, you know, with him. You know, he was just feeding me whatever it was about. And uh, and I said, so now you're going to have to sing it. And he was like, no, I can't. And and I said, the only way you can tell it, this story, is to have you sing it. We can leave it off the record. but And I and he, did, he was embarrassed. I said, well, we'll get everybody out, and I'm just going to bring over the nicest gentleman you've ever met. His name is Colin Linden. 
and everything would be cool. It would just be me, him, and you in the room, and he sang it in it. That's that's something if you um, you know, if you really want to, you know, get deep into it, yeah, you can get that record, Cottonmouth Man, and it's and the last song, Bonnie Blue, and it's just beautiful. Did you um, walk away from um, producing those sessions with any gems of wisdom that you picked up from James Cotton? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, uh, every session I come away with <laughs> something, yeah, I'm learning sure, something yeah. I didn't know, you know. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the the y you really realize guys like Buddy Guy and James Cotton and BB King, you you realize that you know they what they had to go through to be where they're at you know i mean it's like buddy guy walks on stage now and it's packed and people pay 100 bucks a ticket and, and but he never forgets driving you know 16 hours in a van with no heat to get to this town 30 years ago mm. he never forgets it or being um you know having people treat him bad mm -hmm. and uh i mean i asked him one time i said buddy y you're tired you're sick i know it but you go out on stage and you just kill and you just won't stop until you've got everybody in that room you know and he said well you you don't realize he said i came from i i grew up playing places where they didn't want to pay me and they weren't going to pay me but i went there anyways and i'm like really i goes yeah there were places that i would travel to that bb would say the guy's not going to pay you you know and he goes so i just decided i can either not go or i can go and play so great that i'm going to make that man want to pay me Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And and and, I love it. and he said there were times I after a show, I'd just be sitting there in the van and the guy would come out and go, I wasn't gonna pay you. <laughs> but shit, here's your money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, damn. Yeah. And he goes, and I just drive away and go to the next town. So I don't know what kind of educate you know, you know, you can teach somebody how to play <laughs> an instrument and go, All right, you can try to you know or have that kind of schooling, you know. That's why when these guys, I learned from these guys. When when I'm in the studio with with Buddy, he won't leave till it's, till it's right. Mm -hmm. Even if he's, and and it's not like you know, hey, I'm going to prepare for a week, and then get in there and rest my voice and take care of my. He's flying in from Asia or something. Yeah. And he has five days. Yeah. Before he has to be somewhere else to play, you know. So he's. Yeah. And he's Amazing. got that time, and he's still like, "All right, let's do this." What yeah. time you need me there in the morning? You know, yeah. You know, so you, you know, yeah, it's humbling. You know, yeah. <laughs> um, that song you co-wrote with Richard Fleming, is that right? He was there. Yeah. 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 And 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 probably Cotton because yeah, Cotton told Cotton. us the stories. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Richard Fleming is another. You'd probably get in there. Co -writers oh, he's yeah. just wonderful, wonderful writer. And um, as long as we're talking about co writers, let's talk about a little about Gary Nicholson because mm -hmm. you two have written a ton of stuff together. Yep. Um, what is the thing you like the best about writing with Gary? Well, yeah, I also love Gary as a as a person, mm -hmm. as a human being. Yeah. He's just like a, a, an unbelievable human being, and uh, but. You know, it's funny when I, when I first started writing with him. You know, it was another thing like co-writing. You know, that's what he'd done his forever, and I was new guy. You know, so I I started writing and 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 uh, I think he he got it. He got what I was doing. He'd be like, "Whoa, what did you just say there?" You know what I mean? And 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 and, and I think we kind of connected on a different level. It was a little bit of. Um, uh, and you know what, Gary, I, I, he's a master writer. And I mean that, in, in, in my definition of that is he is a master writer, like 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 a master carpenter or a master, somebody that, that knows their craft. <laughs> yeah, yeah, master chef, whatever that means. Like, to me, when I'm in a room with him, 
we don't even have to have started the song yet, but I know he's a master craftsman at, at, at songwriting. And, you know, that's just, uh, so, there's, so there's things that we don't have to discuss. You know, we just go, givens. yeah, givens, like, you know, yeah. you don't have to explain, well, no, we wouldn't do that because it doesn't make sense with the, you know, the whatever we're, you know, he's already, he's a master, so he knows the angle, you know, we can't use that wood, you know, or whatever the heck it yeah. is, you know, yeah. that shingling will never work, you know, he just knows that, mm -hmm. so we don't have to discuss stuff, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Gary knew you were going to be on the show today. And so he called me, and I recorded our conversation. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Let's have a listen. Tonight I met Tom at the Sutler Saloon, and he was there to hear somebody play, and I was there, and we got introduced or something. And I walked to his car with him, and the windows were smashed out of his van, and somebody had broken into his his van. It's like maybe his, you know first week in Nashville that this happened, you know. Tom is a, is a amazing catalyst for making music happen. He has all the skills uh, of, of being a great drummer, but at the same time, he understands songs and structure and lyric content because he's a singer. And so singers make good songwriters, especially when you know, the drums is your instrument. And uh, so he's got all the grooves and feels covered. And then as a lyricist, he's he just makes sense. When you're trying to figure out what a lyric is supposed to be, he's inside of it, right with you, and trying to figure out, you know, what, what's going to be the best thing. Because the thing that I always tell everybody, it's my joke with Tom, I just I know that every song I write with Tom, he's going to record it on somebody. He's producing a million records, so it's like write a song with Tom, it's going to get recorded. Uh, they they call him the, the hammer, but uh, I call him the closer. <laughs> hey Tom, congratulations for being honored in this way by the producer's chair, and um, it's amazing what you're accomplishing. I, I'm so proud of you because. You're just carrying it on and making a lot of music and a lot of really good music. And it's great to see you rewarded for it. So carry on, brother. Come on over. Let's make something up. Good night. <laughs> I met. Oh, what a guy, man. Yeah. That, that's, I forgot about that. Yeah, that when I first met him, he, he, he walked me to my car. He, he was like, where where?" <laughs> Where you parked? And I'm like, oh, I'm parked right over here. And he goes, oh man, I'll walk you over to the car. And I remember distinctly saying to him, oh man, be careful, there's a ton of glass over there. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh shoot, man, <laughs> from my car. And they stole, I mean, everything out of my car. They stole like my guitar, and oh they, they stole, uh, yeah, they stole. I had all these, you know, at the time, CDs, all these <laughs> CDs, you know, yeah. and uh, they took everything, and it was like. Yeah, it was crazy. I just come to town. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Um, how important is the Musician of the Year award to you, in, or Instrumentalist of the Year award to you, as opposed to other awards? Being a drummer. You know, probably. I mean, uh, means more uh, I, for some reason. I had I, a feeling. I, you you know, I don't know. That. I, I, because I, I don't talk about that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know. That's why you surprised me earlier with the drummer question. You know, I mean, I, I, I just, I've always played drums yeah. my whole life, and I've always made a living playing drums, and, and I've, so I, I don't really think about it or talk about it, and, 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 uh, so when it, when that gets acknowledged, you know, um, I mean, I love it when like some somebody I really respect or whatever comes up later on and goes, uh, you know, wow, the drumming on Flesh and Bone or or, or some song, you know what I mean? Sure. And I go, oh, you, oh, great, because they, um, they, you know, I, I wrote it and, I, and whatever, produced it, whatever, but that they noticed that they always, always, I go, oh yeah, let's have a cup of coffee, <laughs> 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 let's get out of here, <laughs> talk drums, we'll talk I drums, you know. <laughs> so uh, okay, um, so tell us your best drummer joke. Oh my gosh! Come on, you okay. gotta have oh, one okay. that sticks oh, out. Okay, well, you've already probably got to given it away, but uh, why does the why does a guitar player keep a set of drumsticks 
on his dashboard. Why? So he can park in the handicapped. <laughs> what up, Bob? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> I love it. I don't know. Oh, that's good. I see. That's good. Any, any other drummer jokes? I mean, while we're at it here? No? No? Okay, just curious. Um, we got to talk a little bit about Quinn Sullivan, okay? Because, boy, you and him, um, you just you just finished his new album. Right? It's finished now, right? right it's out. Midnight yeah. Highway. Yeah, it's it's out. out. Yep. I know. And um, you were telling me, didn't you say that? Like Mick Jagger is at number one. And the Stones and are at number one, yeah. Uh, the Stones, yeah. I mean, yeah. Their new blues the, record. Their is new one. blues record is at number one on Billboard, and Quinn Sullivan's is at number three. Yeah, yeah. yeah Whoa! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, he's doing really well. Jeez, he yeah. must be ecstatic. Yeah. And yeah. you guys just got back from India. Yes. We were playing over in India at yeah. a at a um, blues festival with Buddy. Uh, Tell uh, us about actually that. Actually, wasn't with Buddy. Uh, oh. but it was actually just with Quinn Sullivan. Uh, oh, okay. And, uh, well, Billy I, Gibbons was there, and uh, all right. and Shamika Copeland, some great great acts. Mm -hmm. But but um, but Quinn, we were over there doing the Quinn Sullivan show. Mm. Yeah. In okay. M Mumbai. Mumbai. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And that's a big festival every year. Yeah, it's huge. It's uh, um, there's a lot of people in India. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and and I did it a few years ago with Buddy Guy, but but um, this time it was just Quinn, and um, you know they even have like their own Rolling Stone magazine. Like Rolling Stone magazine is in India. You know you never think about that, like the Rolling Stones here, and uh, mm -hmm. and so there was a big you know big thing about Quinn and his record, and it's because it's because the Indian one of course is in a different language. You know, so it's. Uh, um, it's very cool. So to, to see that, you know, to see that all the people that are yeah, you know, yeah. Um, now, how old is Quinn now? He's seventeen. Seventeen. I figured he was seventeen or eighteen, about there. And how old was he when you guys met? Buddy, Buddy Guy introduced the two of you. Yeah, right? Buddy Guy discovered him, and uh, I was making Skin Deep. So that was like in I don't know when that was, but <laughs> you probably know. Uh, <laughs> but it was a long time ago, uh, and. Um, Buddy was in the studio. Buddy just said, "Hey, you, I, I got this thing. You should check out this kid. He's like seven, or I don't know, eleven, seven or eight, or yeah, I don't know how he old was, he was. Yeah. Well, actually, he was about. I think he was about ten. Ten, and he said uh, yeah. he's just amazing, and uh, it would be great if you could produce a record for him. And uh, so I listened to him, and and, and that was that was a a tough one at first because uh, you know he was whatever nine or ten years old, so." Uh, he goes, can you write the songs and do what you do for me for him? And uh, so that took a lot of, a lot yeah, of nights, like late nights with me sitting there with a guitar going, how am I going to write a song for a nine-year-old? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, that's one of my favorite records. That's his first album. It's called Cyclone. Mm -hmm. And his voice hadn't changed yet. And um, so he probably, you know, I know he probably thinks of it as, oh, my gosh, you know, I sound like a girl, you know, or something. But... Uh, hmm. the, the tracks and the songs that we came up with uh, and I wrote a lot with Richard Fleming on this record because I, I would have Richard come over because I'd say okay I need to write a song that's a um, the, 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 the analogy I had in my head was let's write like an early Beatles album where the songs are about uh, he can't he can't write about how hard it is in life a blues or you know love. Yeah, you know yeah but it, he can write about love but if it's just in a in like a friendship happy playful yeah. way like yeah. I want to hold your hand or yeah <laughs> you know uh, you know yeah. that kind of thing so we wrote and it just so happened he was a Beatles nut so I had all these different changes and of course it wasn't really a blues record it was more of a you know a, it really it was really complicated record and he just took to it. Like he was like, oh, I'm all over that. I love that song, you know, because it, it it made sense to him because uh, mm -hmm. he was such a Beatles fan, and so that you know that worked. And then now now we're able to write relationship songs and and yeah. songs about stuff and uh, you about know life, like, yeah, yeah, life. Yeah, because he's lived longer, you know. So yeah, um, can you describe? How would you describe? Because you've known him for ten years, you know, kind of thing. How would you describe his growth as an artist? It's it's amazing. I mean, it, it's 
I know it's it sounds weird to talk about a kid that's 17 and he's out there playing and because everyone knows young young artists and young kids but he is something but he's out there playing with buddy guy yeah yeah he <laughs> is he is different yeah. it's different and um yeah y- you know the one thing I, I i've said to a lot even the record company i said you have to see him you can watch the youtube stuff and you can follow that stuff but you have to witness him on stage playing and because he really it, it, it's really deep and he's really feeling uh and he's and it's amazing what he's playing and singing at the same time and so and he's not uh you know he's really down to earth because he because he does know buddy and yeah. he does know guys like that that say no you don't phone it in you never phone it in you know you don't skip you know you need to listen to miles davis you need to listen to that mm-hmm. you need to let you know no take that crap off you need to check out what jeff beck was doing back in you know so he's constantly like yeah. listening and feeling stuff and then uh he'll come to sound checks and he's you know he's he's playing stuff that you know he's into Derek truck so he's he's playing all this Derek truck stuff he's he's picking up so he's just he's just constantly um uh growing yeah so he is he is you know wonderful spiritual. the first time you're on the show we talked a little bit about quinn and so i've kind of g- went back you know and i listened to a lot of i mean i i <laughs> i even went back and looked at his you know when he was five years old or six years old ellen degeneres had him on the show playing guitar yeah he was that good when yeah. he was a kid yeah, he was on oprah when he was like four or something yeah when they just searched for people that were like crazy talented at something and for no reason for it whether it was uh mm-hmm. you could you know i don't know i know do arithmetic or something he, he could play guitar and then you could well ask i've him, listened you know. i've been listening to the progression of his voice and yeah. i know that you're the guy responsible uh-huh. for for his voice coming and and i mean now his voice is coming starting to come into its own now you can hear yeah. you can hear his sound now yeah, yeah. He's, he's definitely going to be so someone wonderful. to be reckoned with, for sure. Um, for those of you who haven't read my column, um, I asked Tom um, how an, if there were a new blues artist in particular here in Nashville who was looking to further their career. Um, I was I was asking you how one would go about doing that how that artist would go about doing that and you had some really interesting things to say and that was just you and me you know in that column right. interview that we did together right. but i think that's worthy of putting into the show so could you share that with us well i think one of the things that i mentioned just because uh, i know how, how hard it is i mean you know uh, whatever just trying to trying to be in any genre trying to trying to be heard but i know that in the blues there is a thing called um in every town, I think, pretty much every town, there's a blue society, right? Mm-hmm. You guys are part of the blue society here yep. or something? Well, Nashville has one. and um, Tennessee has one, too. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's – uh, and then they have uh, the Blues Awards, which, which uh, used to be called the Handies in Memphis. They're the Worldwide Blues Awards, which uh, he's been talking about, all these awards. Um, they have – they sponsor a thing called the IBCs, which is the International Blues Competition. And I know it's a competition, but the thing that I think it's cool about it is that you just get to be heard. So um, they have uh, each city is represented at the awards. So they'll have uh, all the blues bands in Cincinnati or so. You know, they, they, they for a couple nights they have uh, these these showcases and, and they pick a few bands to go down and play in Memphis where everyone's at. So when I'm in Memphis at the awards, uh, I'll see uh, some of these bands, and uh, right, and actually Susan Tedeschi was. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's how she. That's how she got started. Well, you know, kind of, kind of how she got so- seen by everybody. Yeah, because she was in Boston, and we went down and played at the thing. We didn't win, but I went down with her, and um, mm-hmm. of course, you know, while we're there, everyone's going, "Wow, that this this person's great," you know. So um, that's that's one way. I mean the. Besides, yeah. besides getting in a van and <laughs> <laughs> and just going out and going out and doing it, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Um, all right, your your new album, your yeah. album, yeah, the Nola Sessions, yeah. <laughs> I love the name, and 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 you got to. Do you all know what Nola? Yeah. You know what it is? Yeah. Everybody knows. No, no. 
No? Okay. Well, just, just New or it's just short for New Orleans. I went to New Orleans and did it. And yeah. um, and I was just calling it the NOLA sessions. I was going down there to, to, to uh, record. Yeah. Yeah. And you had a wonder, a really funny and a, and a wonderful story. You you um you mentioned to me about um, um getting Alan Toussaint to do a duet with you on yeah the album. yeah well yeah. you know what I wanted to do um this record what I'm 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 anxious for y'all to hear this one and I I've been kind of tardy in getting this thing done because I've been working on other records but um it's going to be my next solo record and I wanted to do it in a in a when I'm in Nashville. Basically, I'm available. You know, I'm, I'm making records, and if someone calls me and says, "Hey, uh, we need to do this," uh, you know, I'm, I'm okay. Let's do it. So I kind of uh, juggle things, and the only way every time that the record company said, "Hey, make your own record," can we book it this week? I would say, "Okay, let's do it this week," and then someone like Casey James would come along, and I'd go, "Wow, man, we should go in and write a song or do something." And so I would kind of blow off my thing, you know, for whoever. Yep. Just because I'm just want to be creative, you know. And I'd always think I can always get to do my thing. And I said, well, I'd have to be somewhere else. And uh, where? And I, of course, I said, well, Memphis or somewhere out of town. I'd have to be somewhere out of town where when someone called, I'd say I'm not in town. And uh, so we decided to go to New Orleans. And um, and then I then I said, and and actually, I would like to do with people I've never recorded with. At a place I've never recorded at, with musicians I've never met, I, you know, I just want to be completely just uh, have some guys come in each day, and I'll show them the songs I wrote, some of the songs I wrote the night before, in the hotel, and let's just see what happens. That sounds exciting to me, and <laughs> they went for it, and so we did it, and we called um, a lot of these legendary New Orleans folks, um, and. Fortunately, they all were uh, cool to come out and play, and one of which on the last day was uh, was I just said it'd be great to have. I've got this song that I'd love to sing with Alan Toussaint, and but I asked the guys in, that was I was working with in New Orleans, and they said, well, he's not going to come out. He never comes out. He, he won't do it. And I said, well, same deal. Here you go. Now I'm <laughs> thinking about it. I said, well, can we call him? And they were like, well, you'll never get him, and he'll never want to do it, and you know. And I go, well. You got a number? Can we try? You know, and of course called, and uh, his son got back to me. I think it was, and was curious about it. And you know, I'm sure he had to like look me up or something. And and then uh, I was I didn't think much of it. And the guy I handed it off to this guy John Heidhouse, who's my business partner. I said, John, the, my guy might call back, whatever. And uh, I just stayed up writing songs. Next morning, last day of the session. He, he said, Alan Toussaint just called. And uh, he said he's into it, you know? <laughs> and so I was like, oh, wow, okay. And uh, so we went to the studio, and I told the guys, they said, what are we doing today? And I said, it's the last day. Alan's coming in. And they were just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so there you go. You know, and he came in, and he was gracious, and he was wonderful, and he sat at this beautiful grand piano, and I sat at this little drum kit, and we had an upright bass player, and we sang the song. Um, and uh, he just was was wonderful, you know. And he wanted to. One thing about him too, if you if you guys are recording, you guys like to record. His whole concept was playing the song from start to finish, and he had to take a nice piano solo in the middle of it. And uh, he would he would be playing and the thing would be beautiful and we would be to the piano solo and he would he and he would just get to he go ah I can do it better you know let's start again and and I and I <laughs> and I had him recorded separately I knew he was we, you know we could keep that and just you know it was beautiful but I didn't I didn't want to go there with him I just said he's 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 you know he's he's the king there the Alan Toussaint I said all right we'll just start again and the bass player's like I go, yeah, we'll just start. <laughs> and he'd do this little intro, beautiful. And we'd start, and we'd get to the solo. And then he might get to the last verse, go, oh, I messed up a board. Yeah, let's just start again. <laughs> like, okay, all right, all right. You know, because I, but I didn't want to, yeah. you know, I didn't want to, I guess there's an overdub process for some of you that we could have just <laughs> kept that 
and you know he could have taken three solos you know yeah. while we're done with the track you know but it was beautiful so the the track you hear on the record um is just is the one complete take of us doing it you know yeah and um yeah and it's and it's called the blues been mighty good to me and 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 when i told him about it you know he said yeah i'll come down i'll come down and hear it and play it so he did so when's the album going to be available uh, it's uh <laughs> no pressure here yeah. tom you know I, you know you know the thing that I'm, i think i'm holding up right now is the sequence or something like you know, it's like putting the songs in order or something so yeah i just need to um i just got back into town last night and i've been this out. summer i'm gonna i'm gonna focus and get get this out yeah this summer yeah all yeah. right yeah the nola sessions the nola sessions yeah yeah, yeah. um one last thing, uh, because we're getting on here time-wise, that I that I wanted you to share with everybody, if you would, and that is, um, I asked you, and you know, all the years you've been doing this, and with all of the iconic people that you've played with, and you know, you've heard the list that I read at the beginning when I introduced Tom. I asked you who your greatest mentor was, and you said your father. Yeah. And I'd like you to share with us some of the things that you told me that your father instilled in you that you've um, put into your life and your career. Because I think that, I mean, you, you've already told me. I know what the answer is. But I, I want everyone else to hear this. Yeah, that was kind of... Because I think these are some serious keys to su success in life and well, career. You know, to be honest with you, I don't. You know, you you caught me off guard on that question when I, I was in New York and I was I was just, uh, but yeah, it's still the same. I don't know what I what I told you, but but my dad was, uh, uh, you know, he was pretty much my rock, my anchor, uh, the guy that I could, uh, you know, learn from and. Uh, uh, You know, he taught me uh, uh, pretty much uh, um, he uh, he he was my mentor, you know, and uh, he just passed away. I don't know if you know that, but he just passed away. So I know. So so it's uh, I know not easy, but you know, uh, everything I about being uh being uh you know honest and working hard and um treating people right mm -hmm. and uh you know i looked up to him and uh you know a lot of the stuff that i did in my life you know was pretty much uh you know you know for him you know and yep. my family so yeah. it's all good Thank Sorry. you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> All right, you ready for this? We're gonna do a little quick ten, ten question pop quiz. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. This is a quickie though. All right. Um, your all-time favorite song. <laughs> my my all-time favorite it depends on what day it is. What I mean, uh, my, my all-time favorite pick, song. Pick one of them. Pick one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yesterday. Ah, uh, all right. Your favorite sport. Football. Your favorite book. Ah. Uh, Bury my heart at Wounded Knee. How yeah, about that? Favorite restaurant in Nashville? Well, I do like a good steak. <laughs> uh, so every now and then I'll just, uh, if I'm driving home from Music Row and I, I go back by Ruth Chris, sometimes I'll stop uh -huh. in and just get a steak. All yeah. right. Your favorite bass player? Paul McCartney. Mm. Um, have you ever played with him? No. No? But I met him recently, and that was another dream come true. Yeah. Um, the hardest decision you ever made? 
Hmm. Hardest decision I've ever made. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> did you look at? Did you look <laughs> this down at Chris right now? This <laughs> one. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> I don't, no. Uh, Chris was an easy decision. Yeah. I was like, yeah, that's a um, uh, hardest decision. You know, well, it was it was a tough decision coming to Nashville, but mm -hmm. we did it. You know, okay. we didn't have much, but we did it. Yep. Best advice you ever got. Best bit of advice. You know, it's probably from my dad saying, "Treat people the way you want them to treat you." Okay. Um, um, the one thing that you miss the most. That I miss the most. Yeah. Well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Things I miss. Yeah, I wrote a song called that. Things I miss the most. You and, did? Uh, yeah, yeah. That Van Zant recorded, and wow. uh, it's just about. Being on the road, and uh, the things you miss the most is is usually, like in the song, it was the uh, that last half mile of dirt road and the oak tree on the hill. Mm -hmm. You know, you're home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you're coming home, and uh, so yeah, I'm I'm all good. Great. Um, <clears throat> if you could save any endangered species, what would it be? <laughs> all of them. All of them. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah. Bring me, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Record stores, no. Oh, God. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, what do you like best, playing live or in the studio? Wow, I love it all. I mean, I love it all, but I know you want answers, so I guess I would say playing live because you get the immediate reaction from people, you know? So. Mm -hmm. And last question, what living icon would you love to produce that you've not produced yet? Uh, that I'd love to produce. I'm gonna have to go with Paul McCartney. I, I had I'm a feeling you Paul might. McCartney, yeah, yeah. Tom Hambridge, guys, give him a hand. Be sure to subscribe for new episodes every month and join us next time.